something that's been very dear to my heart from starting here at National Museum Scotland way back in 1989 is textile culture and the incredible collections that we have here in our national collection. And I think it's fair to say that I'm sure that everybody that's in the room um, this evening is very much someone who likes to connect to things. We like to connect to the past. We like to connect to things that we see in museums, our culture, our heritage sites that are around us. And that connection is really, really important. It allows us to understand ourselves today and it helps us to understand our own modern culture too. And we're looking back through modern lenses back at the past. So trying to connect ourselves into what we see and how it relates to what we understand is, um, like I say, I'm sure at the heart of everything that, that a lot of us hold dear and, and hold true in this. So my story is very much about connections this evening. Um, and I'm going to take you through some of our research projects and um, some of our uh, networks as well that we've been developing through at Glasgow. And hopefully we'll see how it connects back into to National Museum of Scotland's footing. And in fact, that's where indeed I'm going to start, because a lot of these connections um, that I'm now developing at Glasgow University as a lecturer in conservation science actually goes back to a piece of work that I did way back in 1995. And it's a small fragment of textile that is here in the National Collection. Um, for those of you who know Hugh Cheap, very distinguished um, scholar of Gaelic culture, and John Burnett, who, funnily enough, I just bumped into at National Libraries of Scotland on my way here um, for the first time for ages. Um, Hugh was putting a display on of um, a commemoration of Culloden, um, the 250th commemoration, and this small fragment of tartan is one of the very few that actually really does seem to have a true connection with Prince Charles Edward Stuart. So there are many, many parts of his hair and clothing that are scattered around many collections in Scotland and further afield. But this was a piece that Hugh um, was, was convinced for once was actually um, uh, connected to Prince Charles Edward Stuart. And it was a centrepiece for um, the exhibition. And my um, expertise that I built up here at National Museum Scotland was to identify dyes using chemical analysis following in the footsteps of Helen Dalrymple, who used to be here, and my successor, Laura Trevelyan, has now carried that forward into her doctoral work. Um, so I was um, slightly worried about doing the analysis because it was only tiny amounts that I had to play with. But I took the merest small amount of, of sample and put it into this machine here called a liquid chromatograph, which used to be in the northwest attic of the building here, where our labs were. And I did the analysis... So this is a piece of tartan from 1746 that was worn by Prince Charles Edward Stuart in the Highlands of Scot Scotland, given to him by Katrina of Borodale on the West Coast. And I find imported dyes. The red dye was cochineal. Oh. And the yellow dye, although I could see the colour on it, chemically it didn't make any sense as to what it was. So after having to get Hugh to come over and say, I can, you might want a cup of tea when I tell you what I'm going to tell you, that this tartan, according to all the history books about what dye should be on that piece of fabric, it's not what we expect. It's an imported dye. Um, is this because it's, it's a connection with France? Is it not made here in Scotland, etc.? All these questions. And that led to a many years of, of research, 15 years of research, and this is where the connection comes in, because to understand those results that I got out of that chemical analysis, yes, I had the physical um, results in front of me, but I needed to extend that evidence further. I had to look at more material culture to understand this one sample. And it led to analysing over 200 samples of um, red fibres from tartan dated to the 18th century. So that was extending the evidence out. And through um, Hugh and John's scholarships in... Um, John um, is very much into economic history. So we were putting the context of the dyes that we were finding on these tartans. And those 200 samples that I looked at also, the red dyes of these quality tartans, were also cochineal, or an equivalent called lac, which is an imported um, 
bread to die as well. We could put those in a bigger context, looking at National Library of Scotland collections and National Archive of Scotland collections where um, the Wilson and Bannockburn collections are there, with fragments of tartan from this period attached to letters where they talk about the colour of the tartan being very important, about its scarlet, about needing to have cochineal to dye it with it. Forgotten information that was sitting there under our noses, but we had lost that connection with with how these, these textiles were being made at that time. And also looking at things like praise poetry. They talk about the, the heroic clan chief or somebody in, on the battlefield being um, triumphant in scarlet. So the colour that we get from this dye is indeed, it's called scarlet by dyers of that time. And there was a definite relationship to that. And then the light damage dyes then led to two PhD projects successively with the University of Edinburgh, where I was sort of thinking, am I looking at almost like the jigsaw pieces of what that original dye was? Can I see the sort of broken down parts of that chemical that made that dye? Can we piece it back together again? And my colleagues, my very esteemed colleagues, were like, that's way too difficult to do. Um, I thought that was a good enough challenge, and I took it to Edinburgh University, to Hamish McNabb and Alison Hume there, and um, after these eight years of, of research, I was able to look at the results and to see that that yellow dye was very likely to be an imported dye as well, something like old fustic, for example, because we could indeed work out what those jigsaw puzzle pieces were. So that is that connection from that one sample, from the, those, the, that one, one textile, it led to many questions and it led to many different contexts, history and poetry and, and imagery and all sorts of things as well as material culture. And that really set me off thinking, this has to always go beyond just my chemistry. It's always got to go beyond um, what I can see with my analysis. It has to bring in that bigger context and to connect things. So the last few years that I was here at National Museum of Scotland, I was dreaming about, wouldn't it be amazing to go into our science and technology connect collection and find something that made a textile that's sitting in the art history collection here, for example. Wouldn't it be amazing to start connecting up those things and to think about the ideas and people that link them together? And that's what I took with me through to Glasgow University. And indeed, this is where my, my launch pad is now, for I'm going to tell you. So, for example, here we have a printing block, mid-19th century. It might be sitting in, say, Paisley Museum, for example. We have a page from a book, an order book, for a a, a company that was making a textile called Turkey Red. Mm. Doesn't exactly look like exactly the same pattern, but might a printing block be sitting in Paisley Museum or another museum that connects to that pattern book which is sitting at, say, Glasgow University archive? Might it have a connection to the Blantyre dye works where they used to make Turkey Red, for example? So all these kind of ideas, how does one start to even think how could we connect, how could we know and I got very interested in these sort of disconnected collections. How, how can all these things that have been dispersed, the physical evidence, but also the ideas and the people that are behind it as well? And are we misunderstanding things? Because that little piece of tartan that I was talking about, you know, of the history books that we read today, people that are writing about making tartans and Scottish textiles in the mid uh, 18th century are talking about using dyes that were native to Scotland and cochineal and lac and old fistic certainly will not. So we're, we're missing the point a little bit. So big challenge, let's start looking to see how we can connect things together. So what I'm going to tell you about in the next 30 minutes or so is um, about some knowledge exchange networks that um, have evolved from that way of thinking. And then a couple of projects that are to do with using scientific analysis, but this wider context about material evidence to, to go along with it. And then to finish up with some new perspectives of, of where this is all heading for some exciting things that are going to be happening at Glasgow um, and in collaborative ways in the near future. So I'm going to start off with this book, which is in our archive at Glasgow University. It's called The Home Order Book, and it's from the United Turkey Red Company Limited. The United Tur Turkey Red Company amalgamated in 1890 from several small companies that existed making 
this, this amazingly beautiful fabric here. And those companies stretch themselves right along the River Clyde, from the Vale of Leven at Dumbarton, all the way down through the Falls of Clyde, down to New Lanark, down to Blantyre. And those organisations pulled themselves together because they had a long history of having existed from the start of the 1800s, making these textiles. And towards the end of the 19th century, um, there was new dyes and new methods of dyeing coming into practice. So this textile sort of transcends over a very important point in the mid-19th century, which is the transition from natural dyes to synthetic dyes. And in our collection, we also have at Glasgow University uh, a calculation book. So these, these sit within the business archive. Sally Tucker and Stan and Edich, um, at Edinburgh University have been looking at the same material for the Colouring the Nation project, which is very much based at National Museum of Scotland, with the incredible pattern books that are here in the National Museum's collections, with over 200 similar books to the Home Order book, page upon page of glorious printed textiles, big, huge tomes. And they were looking at this information, but through economic historians' eyes. We're able to go back through that same material and look at it with more, um, with different eyes, looking at it with a sort of like how, how are things made from that perspective. So information that was almost like gobbledygook to one scholar suddenly opens up another whole area of, uh, of, um, of information for another. So hopefully you can see on the page that's here on the, on the side here, you can see writing here. And you might be able to make out here, it says alizarin. So this here is essentially a week-by-week -week account of the holdings, basically, of one of the companies within this United Turkey Red company. Um, in this case, it's the Alexander Orr Ewing um, uh, um, company from 1875. And basically, they're listing all the things that they, I think it's what they've used that week to make their Turkey Red printed textile. So in there we see that there's dyes, we see that there's um, things like um, sumac, which they would have used for preparing the, the calico that they've dyed onto, um, and all of the sorts of ingredients. And I had the crazy idea of like, hmm, could we work back from those ingredients and sort of recreate this, this process? It's a multi-step process. It involves, um, it used to involve up to about 34 different steps. You had to take your calico, you had to prepare it, put a tannin onto it, you had to oil it, you had to then sort of like put down the, 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 the dye, then you had to discharge it and then print onto it. Very complex process. Um, and again, it was one, it's a bit like the tartan thing. It was, um, there's lots of people say, oh yes, this is, this is how it was made. And I was like, well, how do we really know? And also, because the, tart the, tart the um, turkey red manufacturers were also said one of its selling features was that this was the best red colour you could put on to cotton. Cotton is very hard to dye just by virtue of its, of its chemistry. It's very hard to hold a dye onto it. So before synthetic dyes came along, um, things like Congo red, it was very hard to get a very solid bright red colour on, on, on cotton. And the turkey red makers said we can do this with this process and it's resistant to light so a lot of the export from west coast of scotland was to places like china and africa and west coast of america or east coast of america um, places where it's a lot sunnier let's be honest than it is over here in scotland and it had a great market then a lot of the patterns that are on these textiles reflect the markets that they were going to as well so they are incredibly beautiful that led to, um, very fortunate, just as I arrived, I very innocently, somebody said to me, oh, there's something called the Lord Kelvin Adam Smith Scholarship at Glasgow University. It's almost one of these hen's teeth moments where it's very hard to get funding, but they really like interdisciplinary projects. And I thought, oh, I'll give it a go, not realising just how prestigious these things were to get. Um, and it was with somebody um, called David France, who's in chemistry at Glasgow University, and the idea was, at that time, it wasn't, we didn't know it was going to be turkey red, but we wanted to recreate something that was getting made in Scotland in the 19th century. What could we find um, in terms of in the archive, in terms of information? And we were very fortunate to have Julie Wirtz um, take the scholarship 
on and Julie finished her PhD um, just the end of, of last year and she um, took a, she got very excited when she saw the information that was in the archive and set about then bringing together modern chemistry and historical research to recreate this amazing textile. So we can see here is um, the equivalent of that white box that I showed you did the dianalysis. This is our one that sits over at Glasgow University, our chromatography setup, which we use for our dianalysis. And Julie set about doing each stage very systematically through modern chemistry eyes. Um, she found a lot of uh, interesting um, reactions to it by her colleagues in chemistry who were doing all sorts of modern chemistry in the same lab and saying, why are you using old tech? Why are you, why are you, doing, why are you making your dye in this way and not using like a new process? She's going to actually try and recreate something from 1880. And it... it it didn't quite sink in, I don't think, with her chemistry colleagues. And there was a little bit of dangerous stuff that was going on as well that Julie was doing in terms of what she was mixing together and everybody would like, run to the side of the lab and go, you, you do that with the hot sulfur acid and we'll stand over here. So she set about recreating the process and alongside that, again, that essence of like um, wanting to um, also look at, at lots of examples of, of these textiles in museums and archives and lots of um, archive-based information in books, a lot of written text as well to, to recreate that, with the purpose of, in this case, can we authenticate... The ultimate goal was can we authenticate turkey red in an archive collection? Can we be absolutely sure it definitely is made with a turkey red process? What is it that's unique about it? Um, and, and actually, the oil that's still used... The oil that was used for the turkey red process is still used today. It's actually called turkey red oil, and it's used by companies that make um, plastics. They use it as a, a polymerization agent as well. And people, uh, when Julie was researching the background to the oil, she was finding that nobody really understood quite what the oil was and what it was doing. So we had a modern purpose to this as well. So Julie was using text. I mentioned from about 1880s, 1885, 86, and taking that information and, and translating it in a scientific way into modern chemistry. Um, this is what calico textile looks like, dyed with madder, with no oil. So she follows the process of this turkey red um, uh, creation. That's the colour that one ends up with without any oil. So the oil gets added in about halfway through the process. And there was interesting things. We saw um, the words animalizing getting used in the texts from the 19th century. So it's, and it's almost like, we haven't still quite worked out exactly what that means, but it's almost like it was easy to, to dye wool and silk, which are animal fibers. And it was almost like the dyers were believing that putting this oil on was sort of making a pseudo wool-like environment, which Basically, actually, what they were doing was creating a, a paint pigment, basically, on the fibres instead. They're kind of producing it in that way. But this is what Julie was able to replicate by using that oiling step. And you can see that difference. You can see the redness that's in there. And that's it with using natural madder. And then she also did it with synthetic alizarin. And it's actually very hard to actually distinguish between what's synthetic and what's natural dye in this case, and that is why we have to use these chemical techniques to do that analysis. So that was excellent because now Julie had, um, she understood the process by having done it. She'd learnt tacit skills, so the experience of, the experience of doing it um, was so invaluable in itself, how to interpret these things where it was almost like either because it was common knowledge that the detail wasn't in the text or because the text wasn't giving away all the secrets that was in there. So she had to sort of piece together how to do some of these processes. It got to the point where we could use a, a technique called infrared spectroscopy. And in this case, it's one where it's a portable piece of analytical equipment that we could take to the collections. And Julie was able to be confident enough that, yes, she could say that this textile might be red, but... By, picking, by using this technique, she was able to say, there's oil here, it must be turkey red. And she was able to do that for some collections at the Victorian Albert Museum and other um, organisations as well were interested in, in having their um, turkey red examined. So that was a great result because now we can 
authenticator in that sense. And she was also able to do some dianalysis. So these are graphs and each of those little spikes that are there indicate um, there's a chemical compound that's coloured. So these two compounds here, purpurin and alizarin, are the two components that one finds in natural matter. And that would fit with the date of this text, the turkey red textile, which is from the late 1700s, which is when they were starting to produce it in the UK. And then here's um, some samples, um, and it's a thread from a piece of turkey red from 1899. And you can see just by comparing, just doing a pattern match, you can see that there's, there's more spikes, there's more peaks, more components in the bottom one. And these ones here are indicative of synthetic alizarin. So, um, so that was good. So we could, we could use two things. If we couldn't take a sample for dye analysis to analyse it this way, then um, it might be to sort of do something with the infrared um, portable as well. But certainly we could say we, whether something was turkey red or not. And that has implications. I'll talk about it in a minute. But it has implications for then what archives can do with these collections. So in that process, one of the papers that Julie was referring to was by this... Um, very distinguished dye chemist called William Perkin, and anybody that's into historical dyes will recognise his name as the, the person who found, created, discovered the first synthetic dye that really changed the whole of textile um, history as we know it in the mid the mid 19th century. And this is a paper where William Perkin, who was always one to uh, look out for some sort of a um, good commercial use for his dye chemistry, realised that. He, that it was possible to make the synthetic alizarin to replace the natural madder, and one of his biggest um, uh, markets was going to be the turkey red industry. And you might notice on the page of this very, well, as a chemist, I'll say this, as a very dry journal, <laughs> um, the Journal of Chemical Society, sitting on the shelf in the chemistry library at Glasgow University, um, there's two bits of fabric on that page. That's not normal, actually. I wish all our chemistry journals had <laughs> lovely textiles and patterns on it, but unfortunately it's not so. Um, so that was interesting. And then, I said, so Julie and I, you know, Julie took, was able to take a little sample from it and analyse it or whatever. And then by chance, I saw um, that we had... Oh, that's right, sorry. So it says here, so it says here that but the patterns being here are dyed at artificial alizarin, and this is Perkins saying that you know he is he's thinking here as a a, a dye chemist with a very commercial market orientated reason for this. So what he's done is to say, here's this brand new dye. I'm going to go and test it out on the people that I need to convince to buy it and to use it. Here, look, this is what you can make with it, and that looks like the turkey red that we see at the top sample. Looks like the turkey red that we see um, in those pattern books that we're looking at. Um, here's another copy of that journal, exactly the same journal, it's the Journal of Chemical Society from 1870, opened up at page 133. This one sits in the special collection at Glasgow University, so we've got two copies of the same book. Oh look, they're different bits of fabric. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's interesting. That got me thinking, hmm, right, okay, how many other <laughs> bits of fabric are there in other copies of the same journal? And this sits on the library shelves of just about every chemical library in the world. So for International Archives Day last year, I got a blog guest spot on the university's archive and we put out a call, we put a shout out to everybody that's got your hashtag per Perkin Patterns, go take your copy off your shelf of your Journal of Chemical Society from 1870, open up a page 133, send us a photograph of what you find. That's what we got back. <laughs> And look, look at all the variation. And I haven't done it here, but I did actually manage to match up a couple of them. Um, and there's somebody at Glasgow University who's very much into digital humanities, and we're going to work together to see if we can mix them up, because I'd love to recreate that whole big thing. So when it comes around to Archives Day this year, we'll be releasing this, inf you've seen it ahead of time, we'll be releasing some information. Some interesting things here. So the ones that are on the, the, the site here, those are the two from Glasgow University. So you can see there's ones that are very similar. This seems to be kind of recurring. Um, but then we get odd things. Um, Newcastle University, mm -hmm. we were like, oh my goodness, what's happened here? You've got something completely different in there. And it was only when um, we were f um, getting the images ready to put them onto the website with the archivist that I was working with, um, we noticed actually that those two bits of fabric are hiding up 
samples that look like, I think it was up, uh, uh, I think it was this one here, something like that. It's actually sitting behind those bits of fabric. You can just see them poking through. And poor old National Libraries of Scotland, they were very disappointed. They were like, we've got that journal and we have no, we have no um, textiles at all in us. So, um, so that was really interesting. And that went to America. We've got people from um, the States, Illinois, Amsterdam, Cambridge. It got quite exciting. And everybody's like, what happened to my, pa my, pa my Perkins pattern? So, um, so that continues. So if anybody knows of a copy of the Journal of the Chaos Society, go and have a look and photograph it and send it to me. I'm absolutely thrilled to have it. Um, but that opens up many questions. The different colours that, for example, here, same pattern, but that's a sort of much paler colour. Is that degradation that's happened? Is the quality of the dyeing not very good? Many more questions it's opened up. So, because of this connection, when Julie started her research, I thought, um, do you know, we need to be talking to people that are historians of technology, we need to be talking to people that are historians of design, historians of, of textiles. We need to talk, basically. I do a lot of talking, <laughs> and I like talking to a lot of people. Um, so with the wonderful Klaus Dubman, my very dear friend who's here at National Museum Scotland, or well, not for much longer, I don't think, um, but um, Klaus and I put together an application to the Royal Society of Edinburgh to ask for one of the... Um, uh, Knowledge Exchange Network funding grants, and we were very successfully um, awarded one in 2013. So that started off with a knowledge exchange, just to get the, the conversations going, basically. And that then led, um, because of the success of that, um, we ended up applying again for the next stage, which is a research network grant. So we've had two projects, one re called Reinvent and one called um, uh, Recreate. And the idea is to connect up how textiles were getting made in Scotland in the 19th century. Who did we need to talk to? Who did we need to talk to today to understand that process? Because that will give us an insight as to who was talking to who back then, if you see what I mean. And also to start connecting up things that are in collections. So who's got what and what collection? What could we use? What information? What material culture? How could we pull this together? So those, those are the two networks. So reInvent kicked us off. And we had three workshops. Um, we got ourselves together. Here's Julie talking about um, Turkey Red. So we talked about materials and suppliers. What was needed to make um, textiles at this time? Who, 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 was, who was supplying it and, and who, who was making it? And for those of you that know John Hume, who used to be the Royal, to the Royal Commission, I've seen a few nods, the amazing John Hume. If we could have a little pocket John Hume, everybody would be a much better in this world, I think, Little John Hume in their pocket. He's just an amazing person, a great scholar of, um, of industrialised uh, processes in, in Scotland and particularly very keen and interested in textile heritage. And um, John was just saying, just sort of like throwaway comments like, well, of course they'd make linen on the East Coast because linen would absorb a lot of water, so it'd be quite heavy to transport, so you wouldn't want to be bringing it across the Atlantic. Yeah, like... Never thought about that before. All right, okay, yeah, get that. That's why the East Coast is, tends to be like jutes and things. Also, obviously, the trade with cotton from the West Coast of America and the supplies through that. Um, things like that started to sort of gel in our heads. We had people saying as well, um, uh, what about like rope making, for example, the rope works that were at Greenock, where the, that, um, uh, uh, a lot of that... Uh, Heritage is now at the Scottish Maritime Museum, for example. Um, how can we connect up making the ropes there? You'd need the ropes to work the machines that made the textiles, for example. So all that kind of interconnectedness really got us thinking. Basically, that first one was just to kick off to say, is it just Klaus and I that are interested in this, or is there others out there? And we've got a resounding, oh yes, there's lots of people out there that really are interested in like connecting up things together. We then came here to National Museum Scotland, and this is Dan Coglin. Um, who is uh, uh, the curator or the senior curator at Paisley Museum and Art Gallery, an amazing person, a weaver by background who has literally put together looms and can work them. And this is him um, working the loom that's in the Museum of Scotland. Um, and you can see us all standing around watching um, this piece of technology in action. And as soon as it's in action, it makes a whole different... Um, sort of way of understanding those objects. So part of this network was to say, what could we, re what, would, what would be good to recreate processes and techniques 
and the working of things. Because again, it's like seeing something in action just adds a whole new meaning to what that static object is. And just to get the clack, as soon as um, uh, Dan was weaving on the text down, the clack of the noise, the visitors just came out of everywhere. So, you know, that power, the draw of, of that was just great. Um, again, confirming that we do need to sort of like be in this process of recreating and showing is really important. We then went to Summerlee and looked at um, production and powering the equipment. So what was needed, the water wheels, the sites, the connections between what these buildings were and, and how they operated was really important. So taking it to that industrial level. And then we culminated with a public event which is at Mary Hebborough Halls. And, you know, we must have got so excited about doing the public event because we all took along things from our collections. So it was about eight stalls, I think, for want of a better word, where people had taken along, here's some example of printing blocks, here's some textiles that were in an archive, here's some, you know, piece of engineering, here's some books about um, making textiles in the 19th century. I didn't get any photographs. The only thing I had a photograph of was this, which is the cake of the logo, which went down a big treat <laughs> and still much talked about today, actually. <laughs> that was uh, one of our highlights. But no, that, that was great. Um, and again, like it gave us the incentive to say, yes, that the point of this was actually to try and create an inventory of what we found and actually stick, which is the science and technology um, in, uh, knowledge exchange um, group have taken it upon themselves and now have like um, directories and information about tools and things which we can tap into. So that led then to Recreate, which was more focused, it was a smaller number of us, 16 collaborators, thinking about what we call the experimental culture, this who had to talk to who. So that goes back to sort of like saying about having somebody who had a design head on them, somebody who is an archivist, somebody who is a textile historian. Could we get objects out of collections, put one object on the table in front of us and all look at it with different disciplinary eyes? I'd look at it as a material scientist, somebody else would look at it as a technology um, and a historian. What did we see when we looked at that? What would we talk about? What would we wonder about? It was, it was fascinating. Um, and it was all to do about making decorative textiles in Scotland. So from Julie's perspective, to have these networks created as she was a scholar and, re and doing this um, uh, research was just so invaluable and it'd be great and that was part of the, the reason for doing it was to have early career researchers to come into our world and, and to pick up and, and to connect with, with people that were doing all this research. So again another multidisciplinary research network um, that led us into archives, it got us out onto the streets of Paisley, John Hume took us around buildings in Paisley and, and now I can read a building if it's got um, a mill or a weaving shed in it. I can do that now based on the size of the numbers of the windows, which is quite good. We went to Manchester and had a look at um, their textiles there and we found that, uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot of connection between Manchester and Glasgow in terms of its textile heritage and there are collections that are there which would be good to reunite together in terms of especially the turkey red making, for example, but it was much more than that to and the National Museum of Scotland collections here. And that is indeed, if anybody recognises this gent here, that is indeed Robert Anderson, former director of National Museum of Scotland, went on to be director of British Museum. Um, and he is a, a interest in history of science. And I asked him to come along and uh, um, come and talk to us about the scientists that were talking about in the Age of Enlightenment and into that sort of middle of the 19th century. Who, how, who were they talking about and what were they talking about as well? The information you can see, what, the, um, what we gathered is on our website, which is held at Glasgow University. So if you tapped in Recreate and Glasgow University, you'd pick up the web pages and you can read all about the, the, what the information that you found for this and for reInvent as well. Um, so yeah, it was enough to get Robert to come over and go, yes, I'd like to come and talk about that as well, which was fantastic. So. Design and colour, laboratory materials and experimentation, handmade textiles. That was really interesting. It was that transition. I never really thought about it. It was the transition of going from an individual skilled craftsperson at the start of the 19th century that had all the information up in their head because they would do it as an individual. How did you transmit that information by the end of the 19th century to 50 textile makers in a, in a factory? So there was a whole... Um, it opened up our minds as to the information sharing and that information knowledge. How did one transmit that knowledge between people? 
How did one um, have, like, it might be an engineer that might come along and say, I've got a new printing, a bit of equipment that you could use for making your textiles. What might the designers and the dyers say? Oh, well, yes, could you, but, you know, the viscosity of your dye that was going through, could it go through your bit of equipment, for example? They'd have to work together to know if that bit of new equipment could indeed be taken into the into the factory floor. It really made us think about where, and it made us think about where that information would exist. And I can remember Dan showing us um, a book from about 1930s. It was a bit later than what we're looking at, but it was a little book. And I opened it up and I thought, I, I genuinely thought it was a book of mathematics. I thought it was a scholar's book of mathematics. I went, oh no, that's how you'd warp up a loom. That's all the calculations for warping up a loom. And it was just a page of maths. And that was information that was getting transferred from a skilled craftsperson to apprentices. So it was that exchange of information. And it really made us think, yeah, how did you move that on? So the power of the book and, and what that made meant um, was, was really important. Um, and that then took us into mechanising these processes that had been hand done at the start of, the, of that century. So again, all the information is on, on the website to, to have a look at. Um, and then we culminated that with a public event, and this was really exciting because we just stood back and just looked at it. Again, we had like eight stalls of things that were like, you know, again, printing of textiles, archives of textiles, looms, it was in Paisley Museum, the looms around it. And we stood back and we said, when was the last time that all these things had been in the same room together? And that was quite a powerful thing. You know, here's the, uh, a book that somebody used for designing a textile, and here's a textile that's a bit like it, beside it, from the same period. And that was a, it was really evocative. You started to get a real sense, and we got a very good reaction, but about 100 or so people come along on a rather wet Saturday afternoon um, to Paisley, um, and they really got it. They, they understood quite what we were doing and asked, asked for more of that kind of thing. That then led, with Julie's research and the Recreate Network, it then led to National Trust of Scotland getting in touch and saying, we've got something in our collection that we've often wondered about. Um, it's found at the site of the David Livingston Centre and it's, it's, it's supposed to be a tube of, um, of a little glass vial. Has it got turkey red dye in it? And Julie was like, hmm, that's interesting because turkey red's a process. The whole process of making the dye is turkey red. It's not an actual physical dye itself. If you mean. So that bamboozled us a little bit. Um, and National Trust of Scotland very kindly were able to take the, the end off it and we could get some sample out of it. And Here's the interesting thing. So this is a map of Blantyre, something called Blantyre Works. And you can see it talks about madder mills, cotton mills, power looms, and gas works. And this little vial was found on the ground. I think, I think it was before the David Livingston Centre was, was um, developed at the site. I think it already was um, held by somebody at that time. And here's where the David Livingston Centre is superimposed today on that map and the vial was kind of found in that vicinity there so it was in the right location for where a dye works had been and Blantyre works um, Julie then found out was actually um, a maker of turkey red textile at that time uh, we did some analysis I took the sample with me to colleagues at University of Amsterdam and I did some research with them there and we did indeed find that there was a colour on the, so these little um, pieces here are magnified parts, particles from this um, vial here. And we found these dyes. These are two synthetic dyes called methyl violet or crystal violet. And the question mark means that we're not quite sure if they definitely are that because this vial would have sat out in the sunlight for a long time and there was chemical kind of information in there that we couldn't quite work out. So it might be sort of light degradation that's caused some changes. Um, and we also were able to get some inorganic analysis done as well. And iron oxides is something that's used a lot in the printing of textiles at this time. Um, so it seems that it could be some kind of residue. We're not quite sure if it's part of the printing process. It could be some kids found a vial, a whole lot of dirt, and just scooped up a whole lot of stuff. We don't know how connected they are together. Um, but um, it has at least got something that looks like it might have something to do with the, with the dye works. And that... It was just like a, a little use, one small sample of things, but something that just sort of changes a different relationship with that, with that um, object that's there. And this then leads us into the synthetic sort of dye period. Um, all these amazing 
dresses that appear in the mid-19th century at this transition point with um, synthetic dyes coming in and, and gradually taking over from, from uh, the natural dyes. And this got me now thinking, because of the Recreate project, um, I now realised that there was books and information that existed in archives with textiles in them. And set me off sort of thinking, I wonder how we could sort of understand what the dyers were doing. So you'll see on the, keep your eye on the little file at the bottom, the dyers in this period, there's a very long tradition of dyers for centuries keeping notes about what they do and how they dye with things. So they write down their process, they write down what they use, what we call dyers manuals um, and pattern books. And there's a book here in the middle, it's from 1865, and you can see there's a little sample of, of textile that dyers put onto there. So that's a very, again, a, a long tradition, centuries of tradition of keeping notes and a sample of the textile that you have dyed. That was a dyer's notebook from Bradford um, College of Textiles in their archive. And it made me think, oh, I wonder if there's other books that have got those little samples in them, and, and indeed there are. And you can see um, the dyeing that's going on in that bottom corner. You can see within five minutes the dye has transferred very effectively onto that textile. Big questions about, like, well, how exactly, how fast did synthetic dyes really come into sort of being taken up by these, you know, the big textile industries of the 19th century? Is that the reason why dyers wanted the synthetic dyes? You read the books and it's sort of like it's almost like day one to day two. Day one was natural dyes, day two was synthetic. How, how quickly did it take over? So this then led to looking at these books called dyeing manuals where they literally have bits of textile on the pages. And these are books that are sitting, a lot of them in technical archives. Um, and they're so unassuming. And I had a glorious time because I put together a personal project of my own. I got funding from the Carnegie Trust um, for my project called Diversity. And I just went around as many archives as I could looking for these dying manuals. And to go into the British Library, I had to you know, sit in the reading room of the British Library and go, oh, just found them this beautiful page. Of, you know, trying not to get too excited by finding these gorgeous things. But you could, but then you heard other little pe squeaks coming from around the archive, from the library reading room. Especially. A lot of people were discovering amazing, amazing things. To go into the National Library of Scotland here and have Isabel Griffin, who's a former colleague of mine, she's now head of uh, conservation, and I was saying, Isabel, look what I have found in your books in the National Library. Said, We've got textiles in our books. I was like, yes, and look at the colours of them, look at the, the fabrics that are in them. Things that were just not known about, um, seeing the British Library as well, they even allowed me to take some samples from, from them as well. So my question was like, just exactly how chemically diverse were these textiles? We get the impression that like making dyes in this period should be like a bit experimental. Is that indeed true? And, and quite what are they? Um, so I was able to take samples, do dye analysis, and be able to link it up. You can see there's a page of text here. It's actually got chemistry on it here. And my colleague, David France, who was supervising Julie, was, who's a chemist, was going, they were writing chemical stuff in the 1880s. And I'm going, this is bizarre. This is, this is our subject area. We don't know the history of our own subject area. They were, they were indeed writing about chemistry in the 19th century. So, you know, there's a lot, lot there to unpackage the consequence. But it was about, like, analysing those samples. And that's, that's me telling myself to shut up. <laughs> I will, in a minute. Um, so we were able to do the analysis, able to pin in by using a technique called mass spectrometry, actually to say that this peak here has got this chemistry behind it, and then link it up with the... There's also text in these pages as well that go along with the textiles. So the dyers and the dye chemists at the time are saying we have... Actually, as a chemist, I am blown away by what they knew and what they said they thought they were making. They were saying on that page that basically they've written it a different way, but they've actually drawn these structures and they didn't have chromatography or mass specs or anything that we've got today. And they did that by just like benchtop um, chemistry. So they actually knew what they were talking about. They knew what they had, and that is a dye called magenta. And then um, sort of things where they say, like, you know, we can make this um, bluer version of this methyl violet by using iodide of methyl and ethyl compounds on here. We did the analysis. There's the methyl, there's the ethyl, and it's in that bottom one and not the top one. It's, do you know, it's that way that, like, it seems so obvious now that it should be that but nobody had done that before up until the diversity project actually doing that analysis. So it's given us a great deal of confidence. And these books now, 
I can show those to a dress historian and say, these indeed are the colours of these dyes at that time, and they've been protected in these pages, these books. So it's, it's a very powerful thing, and there's some magenta there as well. So then we get, uh, just very quickly, one more last little story, is that not everybody was quite as good. Um, this was the wonderful James Napier from Partick. You can take a boy out of Partick, as they say, because he was a bit naughty. Um, he was a dyer in the west coast of Scotland, and here's his page saying Perkins Mauve. This was like the first synthetic dye, very important to show. Looks right, there's another example of the Perkins Mauve from another book. Um, but actually what he's talking about is this one here with natural dye above it, we think. Um, he was very clever at putting in samples of textile in between, very confusingly, in between descriptions and you're thinking, well, at first you go, oh, look, he's got Perkins Mauve in there. Actually, no, he's actually talking about the dye above it, but he's very cleverly placed it. And I think it's actually when I read this in his book that really got me. One wine glass of muriatic acid. So a chemist, muriatic acid is concentrated hydrochloric acid in a wine glass in his lab. And that's his recipe for making these, <laughs> these dyes. So like I say... Your boy out of Partick. Um, but I, I'll go from Partick Station walking up to Glasgow University and I walk along and I think, I, he was walking along here, <laughs> writing his book. Um, it's quite an exciting connection. So this, sort of like, dyeing was sort of, like, taken into the home. So ribbons and accessories, people could do that. So these dyes actually appear on just about all our textiles. So you might have Queen Victoria's purple dress dyed with Perkins Mauve, but that would be made on an industrial scale, using industrial dyes. So now we can look at these books and use these to look at pretty much all our textiles in our, in our collections and think about it. And it'd be great to re-colour our vision about what these things were. And I've heard quite a few people say, oh, my great-grandmother kept going about her purple wedding dress from the 1890s. It, the colour came back in again, and it was a, a synthetic dye that um, got a, a resurgence of, of interest again. Um, really fascinating to start bringing it into people's personal lives. So our future ambitions, now that we've discovered all these books with all these textiles in them, with these synthetic dyes, we want to try and protect them, we want to try and recreate historical lighting. Would it be great to do gaslight to look at some of these books? What are the colours like? There's some of these dye colours that say are blue by gaslight. So there's, there's something about the colour of, of the colour of the dye under, under different lighting. Um, so we've started off a little project called the Filtered Light Project where we've been ageing some of these dyes under different wavelengths of light because it's to do with like, um, lighting um, for museum displays using LED lights, but some of the wavelengths of light might actually start to fade them. And indeed, oops, we did, we did find that some of the wavelengths of light in the new ones, um, uh, the new light bulbs do indeed um, degrade them. And this has then led back round, because it's reconnecting again, to uh, a European funding um, that myself and Shahid from um, New Delhi have got through the European Commission for one of these prestigious um, Marie Curie um, postdoc fellowships. And Shahid is taking forward Julie's um, fantastic research and is developing it as a dye chemist to look at exactly how light fast are these turkey red textiles. So he's following in Julie's footsteps, they're working closely together, and Shahid's recreating his turkey red then he's going to um, expose his samples, because we know we can make it now, um, he can expose the samples to different light to see if it exactly is, is light fast. And he might be able to take, if he can find some sort of chemical nugget of the turkey red process that makes that dye very stable, he might be able to take it back into commercial reintroduction of madder, which has um, been developed more in, in India um, as a commercial dyeing process, they're wanting to, to use natural dyes. So there's something from the turkey red process of the mid-19th century that could get taken back into the process to make it more stable. That would be an awesome thing. And very finally, just to say that um, I talked about Kelvin Horse, our new, our new space and place that we've got, just uh, um, across the road from Kelvin Grove Art Gallery. And all this has now led to me sort of feeling the time's right to be talking about um, new programmes. We're putting a new master's programme on to talk about modern material artefacts. And already, looking at our archive, we found things like leather with sailors' nitrate covered um, coatings on them, which is a, 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 a syn synthetic plastic, which allows us then to use these collections in a new way to teach with and to, to um, create more research as well. So watch this space. Synthetic fibres next, I think. 
So it just leaves me to say a big, huge thank you very much indeed to um, allow me to come and use up your evening this evening. Thank you very much for your attention and thank these amazing people that have helped to make this research possible. Thank you. Thank you.